Welcome to the Champions Rugby Show. I'm Martin Hindley, and we're speaking to the biggest names in rugby to celebrate 25 years of what is now the Heineken Champions Cup. Today, I'm joined by a man from a select list of European Players of the Year who has also scored a Champions try of the season. Up comes Lopez, and then it's Lee. Yarto has got a bend in on the outside. He's previously scored in the final. He's going to score again. He burst onto the scene in the noughties with Bath and has been part of the ISM Clermont Auvergne juggernaut over the past six years, playing his rugby at Fortress Marcel Michelin. A man to achieve the unique feat of scoring in two finals of Europe's greatest club rugby tournament. A pleasure to be joined today by Nick Abendana. Yeah, very good. Thanks for having me on. Uh, first of all, I mean, what have the last few weeks been like in, in France with, with no rugby and having to self-isolate? I mean, as players, how have you been communicating and how have you been coping with it, I guess? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously uh, new waters for everyone, uh, all the players, all the staff, all the teams. Uh, you know, no one quite knows what's going what's gonna to happen. But all we can do really as players is firstly and uh, most importantly, try and stay as fit as possible. Um, which is a tough task in itself. And other than that, you know, just enjoy spending a bit of time with your family and, uh, and you know, trying to pass the time as quickly as possible during the day. This pandemic has, has obviously had a big impact on you personally, hasn't it? Um, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about your, your current situation and, and what comes next when we return to what we, I guess, we used to call normal and uh, we might be calling the, the new normal in the, in the future? Yeah, so you know, I've been at Claremont now for for this my sixth season, and I had a um, I had a plus one on my contract this year, which you know I was hoping uh, to merit. Um, unfortunately, uh, the staff here told me in uh, when was it October that they weren't going to give me the plus one. So effectively, that I knew that this was going to be my last season to to prove myself at this level and to try and uh, win another contract uh, either in France or or somewhere else in the world. And uh, yeah, unfortunately for myself, the the season stopped a bit prematurely, and so I haven't had the the opportunity to play on the big stage and uh, showcase what I still can do on the pitch. And so, you know, a couple of conversations that I was having with uh, with clubs have have dried up. You know, no fault of their own. Obviously, every club now in the in the world is going to be very uncertain about their financials, about what's going to happen, about new seasons structuring, et cetera, et cetera. So. Yeah, for me, at the on the thirtieth of June, at this moment in time, I'm uh, I'm going to be having to to hang up the boots um, because basically there's uh, there's no other option really. Well, we wish you all the best for the next phase of uh, of your career, Nick. But we're looking back now at, at what you've already achieved in what is now the Heineken Champions Cup. Uh, we'll take you back to your to your bath days in a short time. But first, as a player. Can you maybe explain a little bit about what the what the tournament means to to you at the very top of of club rugby? Yeah, so I mean, um, for any player, I think you know playing at the highest level. You talk about the Champions Cup, the Heineken Cup, as it was back then. Uh, you know, that's that's the pinnacle of of club rugby. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to start my trade at Bath, and obviously Bath have got a a, a history having uh, having won the Heineken Cup against Brief. So there was always that aura around the club that you know they're Heineken Cup champions. You know, unfortunately for myself uh, and the team that we had at Bath, we never quite um, had the success in the tournament that we would have liked. I think the furthest we got was um, the quarterfinals where we lost to to Wasps at High Wycombe. Um, even though we we had some pretty big games. Um, and then, yeah, when I had the opportunity to come out to France and play for Clermont, um, you know, the first thing that came into my head was that, you know, this is a team that's going to be in the Champions Cup uh, playoffs pretty much uh, every year that they play. In. And, you know, that was, that's always been my personal goal is to, to win a, a Heineken Cup or a Champions Cup. And so without, without hesitation, I had to take that opportunity uh, to play for such a big team like Clermont. When you were busying yourself with preparing for your European debut for for Bath, was that sense of excitement something that added to the experience for players, or did it bring you added pressure to play sort of in the shadows of some of those legends who won that nineteen ninety eight final in in Bordeaux? I mean, how was it as a as a player? 
Yeah, it was it was it was bizarre, you know. Uh, when you're a youngster, you know, having come through the academy, played a few um, A League games for for Bath, and then suddenly you're chucked into the first team training squad with uh, you know some some of the players that I was lucky enough to play with, uh, you know, Danny Grucock, Steve Borthwick, Lee Mears, uh, just to name a few. Um, Ollie Barkley, you know, these are these are sort of guys that you've watched on the TV um, practicing their trade every every week, and you see them in a you see them in an aura that isn't quite real, and then suddenly you're playing alongside them in the same team against uh, you know someone like uh, Toulouse or or Biarritz when we we lost to them at the Rec. Um, yeah, it's it's very it's very surreal, um, but uh, you know at the same time it, it it brings tingles to the to the spine even just uh, just thinking about those memories. Abandoning, ghosting through one, looking for the support, finds Carraro, Carraro feeds inside the banner and it's on to Abandoning. And Nick Abendanen is going to go over for a very, very well worked try. His third try of the season. How much did, did playing with those kind of characters improve you? And in what ways did they improve you as a player between 2005 and, and when you left to join Clermont in, in 2014? Yeah, I mean, they, they, um, every single player that I've, that I played with at Bath have definitely, uh, you know, improved me in, in, uh, a little bit of their own way. Um, you know, playing outside of, um, of Ollie Barkley when, when I was a real youngster was something, um, was something that really taught me a lot, um, about creating space and, you know, having someone like him with a pass like he had was, uh, was great for me being able to get on the outside, in the outside channels. And then, uh, you know, going through it, Butch James, when we, when he played, uh, at fly half. Uh, and Joey Maddock, uh, who now coaches uh, the Crusaders in in New Zealand, you know he was definitely a big uh, a big help to my game. And so yeah, you know having learnt from some of the best in the game, uh, I definitely used that going uh, going over to France and and playing for Clermont because you know as as a lot of guys would tell you, it's not the easiest thing coming out to France and and playing here and fitting in and adapting to the different lifestyle. But uh, you know, lucky for me, I've I've grabbed it with both hands and I've really enjoyed it. What were the biggest things that changed about your sort of week to week rugby life when when you moved to France and and I, I guess how did it all come about that you you ended up at, at such a, a magnificent club in Clermont? Yeah, it was a it was a funny one. I was sort of I was actually still in contract at Bath um, when I had a call from uh, from their their manager, a guy called um, Neil McElroy, and he asked if I you know would it be possible to get out of your contract and um, and come and play for Clermont. At the time, I wasn't expecting it, so I was a bit sort of taken aback. You know, I personally had always felt that I was going to spend uh, my whole playing career playing at Bath. So at the start, I sort of, you know, didn't really take it too seriously, was still in contract, so put it to one side a little bit. But I don't know, as, as you know, the chats that I had with mates and with, with my old man, who's been a big influence on uh, on my decisions and stuff, my brothers, um I sort of came around to the idea that, you know, if, if I don't do it now, I've always wanted to play overseas. I had a chance to play for Melbourne Rebels um, that same time when Cipriani went over and that uh, fell through, unfortunately. I've always wanted to play overseas in a different country. So if I didn't do it when I did it, I knew that I would never do it and I would have stayed at Bar my whole career. So, yeah, I basically said to ask Bruce Craig if it was possible to leave. Um, you know, I've got this fantastic opportunity to go and play in France. Obviously, he wasn't too happy at the time, but you know he's he's been very supportive of my my career my decision and so I've got him to thank as well and yeah it sort of uh, went through went through that way um and you know it was it was actually quite funny because they were they were also trying to get uh, Benjamin Fell at the same time and um it was also gone through and then Neil McRoy rang me and said, "Oh, look, I'm really sorry, but uh, we're going to have to pull out because um actually uh, Benjamin Fell decided he wants to come to Claremont." So I was, I was a bit sort of like, you know, tail in between my legs, went back to Bruce and said, look, it's all fallen through. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to be here at Bath next season. And then a week later, he, Neil McElroy called me again and said, look, this is so unprofessional. We're not usually like this, but you know, Benjamin Fells actually decided he's not coming to Clem when he's going to Montpellier. So, you know, are you still interested? And, you know, that was pretty difficult then to go back to Bruce and say, look, Bruce, I'm really sorry, but it's actually come up again. <laughs> Can, uh, <laughs> Can I can I leave, please? Um, and yeah, he was he was he was very kind about the whole thing. Um, and yeah, so so I you know, packed my bags and, and moved out here with my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, and now we got two kids. And yeah, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. But take us through the take us through the doors of of that famous club. A lot of people um, will see the the yellow and blue flags on the television, the colour 
the passion, the excitement, the full crowds. But as a player, was was that a bit daunting to to walk in at a time when when Claremore had so recently been in a, a Heineken Cup final? Yeah, it was it was very daunting. Obviously, um, as a sort of foreign player coming into a, a French team when you don't speak the language, obviously you know who all the players are. But uh, I was pretty sure that ninety to ninety five percent of the the French players there didn't know who I was uh, from their reactions when I sort of introduced myself, walked through the door. Um, and at the time, the first season that I came here, they were still using their old training facilities, which was, uh, you know, it was very old school. It was underneath the, the West Stand at the Stade Marshal Michelin. A very basic sort of old school uh, setup. But, you know, you, you got the sense of what it was what it was about. It was all about sort of, you know, hard work and, and a big uh, and a work ethic that um, that sort of drove the team on. Um, it's changed a little bit now because in the second year, then they bu- they built their sort of multi-million pound training se- centre, which is which has been absolutely outstanding. You know, we've got everything on tap there. Um, but yeah, sort of coming in the first the first day when you've got the likes of you know Fofana and uh, Rougeri and um, you know, we had Nalanga at the time. We had uh, there were some there were some very very big names in the in the team. It was it was almost sort of even though I'd played ten years at Bath, it, it took me back to sort of the times when I felt like I was in the academy at Bath, um, trying to earn my stripes. And you know, I knew that you know, first things first, when you come to a club like this, you're going to get judged by your performance on the pitch before anything else. So um, that's why I sort of stuck my head down early on and uh, and made sure that I was fit as fit as possible so that I could um, give myself the best foot going forward. A genuine European heavyweight club for for so long. Um, you actually, I think, you actually lost your first game against uh, Saracens in Europe that season, but won five matches in the pool stage, and then had a chance to avenge that defeat in the semi final against Saracens, beating them thirteen nine. What memories do you have about the way that that Europe transpired for for you in that season? Yeah, I mean, looking back on on my so sort of career at Clermont, that's definitely a season that um, that sticks sticks in my mind. You know, first time really being involved in a Champions Cup campaign where I knew that we've got the team to go all the way. Uh, we we had already sort of um, started really well in the top 14. Um, even though I'd never played the, the first match in the top 14 for Claremont, I managed to then prove myself to the to the coaches and they, they you know, had confidence in me, which then led into the Champions Cup games. And as you said, we lost our first game to Saracens and we beat Sale and... Um, it was Munster, I think, uh, in our group. Uh, we were the first French team to have beaten Munster uh, away at Terman Park, which was, you know, one of the the most amazing memories for me playing there for the first first time. But then managed managing to beat them as well was uh, was incredible. And then, as you said, getting the revenge against Saracens, um, playing down the road uh, from here in Clermont in Saint Etienne, which was supposed to be a neutral ground. Uh, didn't quite turn out that way because you know when we ran out there was only a sea of uh, of blue and yellow, and I remember actually when we were on the bus on the way to the stadium, I was sitting next to Jonathan Davies. Um, he was here for for two years at the same time, and I you know the, there was just an absolutely sea of yellow and blue either side of the bus. You know, it took us a good forty five minutes just to get to the stadium, and um, you know, I just. Sort of said to him, I said, mate, this is this is exactly the reason why you come to to France and, and play for a club like this because those sort of experiences you just don't get uh, playing in the Premiership back home. I remember there was a, a similar experience in the the semi final a few years later in the the Gelon in Leinster, and it was one of the the first times I've been in a stadium and thought that there's no way that Clermont can lose the game with this behind them. Um, and I I don't know that that was how it seemed to me at the time against Leinster. I mean, is that it was did it did it make you um, uh, almost I don't want to say unbeatable, but did it really make as as much of a difference to the playing squad as it as it seemed from the outside? Oh, without a doubt, I think uh, you know that um, that semi final against Saracens at uh, Saint Etienne, and then the semi final against Leinster at um, yeah the Gerland in in Lyon. It's it's hard to describe. There's um, you know obviously you've got the Munster supporters, which I think are definitely definitely up there, but. You know, other than them, I think uh, nothing really can compare to the, the the blue and yellow army in terms of their their passion and and the way that they just love this team. They it's so it's hard to explain when you're sort of walking around uh, around town and when you speak to the locals and when you read things in the newspapers. It's everything that happens. It affects their lives and 
you know, you can almost see that when you do run out on the pitch at places like that, that their, their passion just sort of seeps onto the pitch and it, and it does lift you a huge amount as a player. It's, uh, it's an incredible feeling. You faced Toulon in the final at Twickenham after that Saracen semi-final. Uh, it was the second um, such final in three years. Um, with that in mind, what was the what was the feeling like going to Twickenham within the within the squad? Was there a was there a, a big sense of needing to avenge that final, or was it something that you tried to to eliminate from from the build up? No, I think. Um... You know, thinking back to that time, there was definitely you know our coach put up uh, a few a few things around the 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 change room and around the the meeting room at the hotel about the final they lost to Toulon um, two years before. So there definitely was a a little bit of that. Um, obviously, I wasn't involved, so I didn't take that too personally. But um, going into the final, I don't think there was a single Claremont player who thought we were going to lose. I think we were just we were just in that uh, that mind frame of that we were we were just we just felt unbeatable that year i think everything everything went for us in both the top 14 and the champions cup that year and so you know even looking back at the game and thinking about the game we should never have we should never have lost that game we went we went up uh pretty early on the for finally scored and i think we were 14 points up within the first sort of 30 minutes and then yeah lee halfpenny got them back into the game with a couple of penalties and then um they obviously scored right before half time and then you know the turning point was obviously when uh, drew mitchell scored that uh, that fantastic try i mean evaded about seven or eight tackles and just uh, you know moments like that when you look back and just think oh my we should never ever have lost that game that should have definitely been the first Etoile, as they say, put on our jersey, and uh, it's, it's uh, doesn't bring back nice memories. <laughs> thinking about it, the Guardian newspaper described your try as a little moment of wonder. Uh, obviously, we're going to talk about the one in in 2017 at uh, a BT Murrayfield shortly as well. But um, did it dawn on you at the time that I've, I've just scored a I've just scored in a European Cup final? I mean, did it did, did the enormity of what you were a part of? ever strike you as a player or do you think that'll only that'll only ever come after the the boots are hung up um it definitely doesn't come to you when you're when you're actually on the pitch you know for me actually personally it was quite a funny game because I started I started off well made a couple of good little jinx um put away Nalanga down the left hand side early on but then uh, I think the the time was up for half time when Gitto kicked the ball to me um just before half time and I remember thinking right I'm gonna have a crack at this one when I should have actually just kicked it into the stand we should have gone in at half time um we would have been ahead at half time and you know probably would have actually won the game if I'd done that but tried to have a little uh, dink chipped over and um didn't go <laughs> according to plan <laughs> didn't go as well as the the tried chip went and uh, they obviously then made momentum for them Bastard ended up scoring so we went in at half time up but uh you know only one point or two points up so that was that was playing my mind a lot um, at the start of the second half, I was like, you know, kicking myself. Why don't you just kick it out? Why don't you just kick it out? Um, so I was struggling a bit mentally, trying to get back in the game. And, um, you know, when Habano did sort of squiff that kick and I managed to see a little bit of open space, I knew that uh, being in the 22, generally the fullback's going to be chasing that kick from Habano. Tried a little dink over the top and luckily Carl Heyman uh, kindly um, moved out the way pretty pretty easily for me and ball bounced up into my hands and, and scored. So that was a bit of a mental switch. It sort of went, I went from a, you know, mental battle to a meant right, I'm back in this one. Like, you know, let's do this. We're going to, we're going to win this one. And, um, you yeah, know, that definitely helped get me on, get me back on the right track, the right frame of mind. Havana chased his own kick, but it didn't get any further than Abandonen, who has some space to run into. Oh, Abandonen! in the shape of an Englishman. He can't make up for, for not lifting the trophy, I'm sure, but especially in a team sport like rugby, but EPCR European Player of the Year uh, in 2015. And if you think about some of the names who are on that uh, Roll of Honour, Ronan O'Gara, Rob Carney, Sean O'Brien, uh, Johnny Wilkinson, Stefan Armitage, um, Maro Itoji, Owen Farrell, Leonie Nakarawa, of course, Alex Good, and Nick Abendanen. Has that sunk in yet? What you've achieved to be the the best player in the Northern Hemisphere in that year and to to win that accolade? Yeah, it's it's a it's a funny one because eh? you know I've been, I'm the only one on that list who has won it without actually having won the, <laughs> the European Champions Cup. Um, and I don't know, it's strange. Personally, I I sort of 
feel like the odd one out. I sort of I feel like I shouldn't be on a list with the with those legends. You know, I don't know whether it's because I've not had a, a massive international career. I'm, I'm not sort of obviously anywhere close in terms of a bigger name as as the likes of Ron Nogar, Johnny Wilkinson, um, uh, Rob Carney, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I told you uh, all those people that have, you know carved themselves out huge, hugely successful international career. Uh, I guess uh, you know me and Stefan are, are bringing up the sort of tail end of it, having snuck on there. But it's definitely, in terms of achievements in my career, the the proudest moment for for myself personally, and something that you know I can't wait to to show my boy uh, when he grows up. And it's memories that uh, at the end of the day, when you retire, it's only memories that you savor, isn't it? And uh, that's definitely the the pinnacle of of my career as as of yet. Let's fast forward a couple of seasons to, to 2016-17. Um, a win of the Bouclier uh, in the final of the, the top tours. And you made it to the final again in Europe. Was was that the best ISM Clermont Auvergne team in, in recent years that, that you've been a part of? Um, I think it was definitely up there but i think the the uh, the 14 15 team was was um, was better than the the 16 17 team but having said that we obviously won the bouclier with the 17 team and lost the bouclier in the, the 14 15 team but yeah i mean as a player coming over from england you don't actually understand uh, what it means to the French guys to win this trophy. I mean, you know, I had Wesley Fofana, Cami Lopez, Remy Lamara. I mean, they were they were literally in tears. You know that they they were holding up this this trophy. It's like um it's like the Holy Grail of for every French French player to to get their hands on this uh, this illustrious trophy and um and it sort of was a bit of a reality check. You know, standing on that uh, on that uh, podium, getting uh, awarded the the trophy, and seeing these guys uh, like little babies sort of blubbering away, you sort of understand there what sort of graft, what sort of hard work, all the years that they've they've put into trying to get their hands on this, and uh, they finally do it, and um, you know, it just means so much to them. And yeah, we we were a great team that year. Again, fell short in the Champions Cup, which was. Um, which was tough to take, but uh, yeah, we managed to obviously pick ourselves back up after that and win the win the top fourteen. So a bit of you know, a bit of silver lining there. Was winning the top fourteen all the more impressive in that final against Toulon because of what you'd gone through three four weeks before up in Scotland against Saracens in what was a, a, a high quality final? But did that take an extra an extra bit of of mental fortitude from from the squad to to get over the line in the final? Yeah, it was it was strange really because I think in the fourteen fifteen season when we lost to Toulon and then we had to get back into the top fourteen season, we knew we were still the best best team in the competition. We managed to get to the final against uh, you know Stade Francais and we lost that. Um, in the sixteen seventeen season, it was funny because as a team we expected to win the final against Toulon in fourteen fifteen, whereas I don't think. We actually, as a team, believed or expected that we were actually going to beat Saracens. I think um, you know Saracens were were that good a team at the time that I think the players, when we lost, sort of accepted that. Oh well, that was that was how it was going to go anyway. So now, right, the top fourteen is our focus. It's been our focus from the start of the, the season, and so you know we we're going to put all of our energy into that. Um, which is why I think we went. And we ended up going on and winning it. It was harder in fourteen fifteen because we should have won against Toulon in the final of the Champions Cup. Got to the final against uh, against Stade Francais, but we were still mentally sort of um, struggling, having lost that final against Toulon. That we we didn't turn up on the day. The knockout rounds of the European Cup that season were thrilling. I mean, you, obviously, you beat Toulon fairly convincingly at, at Marseille and Michelin. And then that, that semi-final against Leinster where you, you got off to an absolute flyer and a baking hot day in, in Lyon. And then all of a sudden, you see Leinster in the, in the rearview mirrors coming back in the, last, uh, in the last 20, 30 minutes of that match. That must have been shattering. Uh, to go through as a player, uh, watching the strength that Leinster were coming back in the second half, and was was there a sense that you were you were looking for the final whistle as a as a side for a little bit of a while there? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt, we knew the sort of uh, how fit Leinster are as a team, and that they they would just keep coming in waves and waves. I think uh, when you look when you look at the two sides there, and with the context of the match, I think we deserved to go ahead early on. But as with all French teams, I think sometimes they rest on their laurels a bit and, uh, you know, they don't mentally concentrate for, for the 80 minutes. 
And so, you know, we, we were trying to get the guys to keep plugging away and, and trying to get the message across that, you know, this is going to be, a, you know, a test match until the 80th minute. And, you know, Leinster is such a huge equality side. You know, they, they've got some fantastic players in, in that team. And we had a little bit of, uh, of fortune when, um, when old Rougerie was held back in the, uh, in the ruck and they had their try disallowed. And I think that was a turning point. Once that try was disallowed, I thought, okay, we're safe now. The boys, that will, that will wake the boys up. And, uh, and we managed to just uh, just squeeze over the line. The final was an, it was an incredibly high caliber game. And rather than the result, I'd like to take you back to your try. It was named the, the try of the season in the, the Champions Cup. It must be right up there with, with one of your, your best ever. What are your memories? Well, I'd like to... I'd like... <laughs> I'd like to say, um, you know, I, I did a lot in that try, but actually all I did was catch the ball off Yatta and, uh, and put it <laughs> under his sticks. So I think uh, it's a funny one when, uh, you know, you, you have your in, individual brilliant tries and then you have your team tries. This will definitely go down as a lot of other players um, doing special things to then set me up uh, for the easy dot down. Um, but yeah, obviously, you know, Scott Spedding picking the ball up uh, on his own five metre channel and backing himself to to break through the line uh, from the back, offloading to to Shuli, who then Cami Lopez took it real nice and flat to the line, fed it out to to Yatta, and once Yatta's in the wide channels, and um, uh, he's just an absolute freak of a player. So I've never really seen uh, I've never really seen someone that can do the things that he can do on the on the pitch. So yeah, when he sort of uh, you know handed off Owen Farrell and just flipped it out the back door. Yeah, I was just lucky enough to to be in the right place at the right time, and thankfully didn't drop it. And then yeah, it was a bit of an easy easy trot in to put that one down. But looking back, and it was a it was a great try, and um, you know, especially to do it against a quality side like Saracens, I don't think you see many many teams around around Europe scoring tries like that against um, quality outfits like Saracens. And then and then you repeated it with uh, with so many high quality tries in that uh, rather strange game at Allianz Park a few uh, a few years later it uh, delayed until a Monday afternoon because of the snow and uh, some fine 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 tries part of uh, part of such a, a massive history for European club rugby as well as as for Clermont but um, a trophy last year um, in Europe in the Challenge Cup it seemed incredibly special to the club at the time, the way that it was celebrated by fans and players alike. Um, it seems that the club really relishes playing in Europe, whatever the tournament is. Is, is that fair to say? Yeah, without a doubt. I think, uh, and obviously the, the season we had before that was a huge, huge letdown for the club. You know, we were very disappointed with uh, with our performances, even though we, we did have a, a hugely injury-stricken team that year. We didn't live up to potential. And so I think the easy thing would have been for the coach to say, right, we're going to concentrate on the top 14 and uh, we're just going to you know, leave the, the, the Challenge Cup to the side. But fair play to him. You know, He, he said, no, this is still a, a European competition and uh, we're going to go out there and we're going to win it. I think you got up to a half century of appearances this season. I think it was against Bath back in the, in the pool stages. From a half century of matches in the Heineken Champions Cup, what are the, the best memories to date and what are the things that you've learned the most from playing in, in the tournament? Well, I'd definitely say one of the, one of the best memories was actually uh, you know, earning my 50th European cap playing at the, the ground where it all started. You know, it was, um, I had all my mates there, my family. Um, you know, it's a ground that I hold very, very dear to my heart. Of, you know, it's where my, my in-laws live. Uh, it's probably where we're going to move back to after, et cetera, et cetera. So to have done that against my old team you know that was that was pretty cool pretty special special moment for me and yeah looking back on looking back on a few of the games I, I'll always remember the game that we lost to Toulouse we were winning throughout the whole game last kickoff of the game uh, someone kicked the ball through to their side and anyway they went pass 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 scored in the corner and then they had the kick to win it and he slotted it and yeah, that was that was talking about emotions go from probably which would have been the biggest game for Bath to ever have won in the Champions Cup to then losing with the last kick of the game. You know, that was devastating. I got man in the match that game as well, which, you know, felt like a bit of a, a kick in the teeth. And then Biritz at home was also a young young kid playing against some some huge names there, Yashvili and and the Langa, some some great great memories. But I got to say that uh, you know all my best memories that I've had have definitely been uh, playing for Claremont. Um, not only because the support here for the Champions Cup games at Stade Michel Michelin is just something that it's 
I don't even have words to describe it really. It's uh, you know, top for top fourteen games, it's amazing. But for 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 Champions Cup games, I don't know how they do it. But they manage to just pick it up, um, you know, five or six levels. And uh, you know, when the band starts going and this and uh, everyone gets out their seats and starts jumping, and it's uh, it's very very special. I've got nothing but uh, good memories of this competition. Your final question from me: um, You're only thirty three. What objectives do you still have in rugby? Things that you want to achieve for yourself and that you you want to to experience in the sport. Yeah, I wish the uh, the coaches in in France uh, would say I was only thirty three. <laughs> Over here, thirty three is uh, is getting on a bit. Um, but I've still got the I've still got the motivation, which is why for me it's it's frustrating that at this moment in time, you know, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to retire. Uh, I still feel like I've got a lot to to give a team, whether it's here, whether it's in the Premiership. You know, I've, I still felt that uh, you know the games that I did play this year for for Claremont. You know, I was playing some of my some of my best rugby and was feeling fit was feeling physically strong um so yeah it'll be it'll be more upsetting i think having to retire when you've still got the motivation to play um a lot of guys get the chance to to retire on their own terms and to to hang it up when they want to but um yeah you know if it is what it is it's uh, that's what i got to deal with and uh you know luckily i've got a good uh, good family around me to to make sure that um you know keep my feet grounded <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's um, you know I would love to to get an opportunity to to continue to play. But if it doesn't happen, then you know you've got to crack on with life and think about what uh, the next stage is going to be. Well, whatever those next stages bring, we wish you the very very best. Thank you so much for joining us, and also thank you for for all of the the entertainment that you've given to to fans all over Europe in what has been today a sparkling European career. Thank you very much for joining us, Nick. No worries. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Great to speak to Nick Abenden and a player who has caught the eye in European club rugby tournaments with his dazzling speed and sidestep, either from fullback or the wing. Some fascinating insights on starting out with Bath on a half century of tournament appearances subsequent to that, on being the European Player of the Year in 2015 and on the heartbreak of finals defeats, not once, but twice. And of course, on what comes next in the next period of what has been a glittering career. Please subscribe to our Champions Rugby Show podcast. Leave us a review if you can as well. And let us know which players you want to come on the next shows to share their stories from what is now the Heineken Champions Cup. We've got another European legend coming up shortly. See you next time. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.